in this uh, session on approaching fintech holistically. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the session moderator, Mr. Vivek Balgavi, who will take it forward from here. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, so the so the session that uh, I will welcome my panelists on the dais. Uh, the session that we are intend to chat about is the role of ecosystems in fintech and uh, and all the all 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 what it means and how how it is important for the entire ecosystem to to succeed in this model. Uh, in my experience, so I look after fintech in PwC and I have been in this space for the last four five years now. I have been almost part of this journey from initial curiosity to uh, to almost like a, a place where uh, expectations and realities in this segment got uh, got reset to, I almost call it now FinTech 2.0 and the stage that we are in. And one common theme and uh, while ecosystem as a story seems like a, like a uh, good thing to have in many sectors, but what I realized is when I, when I work with my co-founders in the FinTech space, it's almost a necessity when it comes to world like FinTech. Uh, largely because it's a super asset light model. Uh, it's a technology forward story. It's an innovative business model story. Uh, so there aren't as many feet on street or branches and things like that, which a lot of existing businesses have. Uh, so for reach, uh, as well as both on the demand side, if I want to put it, where for reach, as well on the supply side, which could be funding, uh, there is almost a uh, inbuilt need to work in an ecosystem. So to that, to that I think, Having this as a first session sets the tone quite well for a few other panels. Uh, so with those opening words, I'll, I'll probably uh, invite a couple of fintech partners, Amit, if you want to go first, uh, and Shalab, you can follow, on, on just weighing in on your personal experiences of being in this business and what's the importance of ecosystems that you see in this, in this journey. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Vivek. Uh, taking the cue from what you shared, of course, uh, I'll also like to take uh, all of you through a very small presentation. But before that, uh, what Vivek shared was the theoretical aspect of it and uh, the experiential what we went through is very, very similar. I mean, it has to be. Uh, so uh, asset light, that is what really gives us that kind of a nimble approach where we are able to find a niche. You have really big banks. I mean, uh, when I talk about loan tap, uh, the entity which I represent, uh, we are, I will prefer to call ourselves digital NBFCs because fintech again becomes a very broad word and uh, in lending space you should talk in terms of fintechs and there are many fintechs who only do one uh, pie of the entire chain. So since we are into uh, pure, pure lending, uh, we uh, call, uh, pr prefer calling ourselves maybe digital NBFCs just to differentiate. So uh, I'll just uh, like to take you all through a very small presentation, uh, just showing our learning and probably uh, that, and what Amitab sir was? Uh, probably I can use this mic itself. So uh, the journey uh, which we had till now uh, really is totally built across uh, So uh, this is a very small presentation, hardly will take five, ten minutes, but will give us a structure of how uh, the actually the fintechs are evolving. So uh, what were we doing? And conventionally, I mean, I was also a banker. I mean, I am still into lending space, but the entire uh, core team and all, we have a background from core lending, retail lending. Because see, uh, it's very, very easy to lend money. Because money is not about lending. Money is not about giving away money. Uh, retail lending is all about collecting it and collecting it profitably. And there is where most of the people uh, fumble up. So it's like they think it's all about uh, lending, which is not true. It's all about collecting. That's the way uh, the entire ecosystem is uh, structured. So conventionally what we used to do, I mean, 10 years ago, even five years ago, and even now most of the private sector banks, they have large DSN network, uh, the agents or the direct sales team. For that, you need a lot of infra. Uh, you need offices, you need branches. Uh, whereas when we look at the customer aspirations, the way they have changed, what Amitav Sar was uh, sharing uh, uh, today morning itself, the way ecosystem has changed and the way people are more and more uh, mobile and the way penetration has happened for internet, smartphones and all. So expectations of customers have changed drastically. They want convenience. They want very fast turnaround time. Uh, turnaround time. 
So that kind of expectations are there from the customer. And that's why uh, there is a space for people like us, people uh, who are very agile, who are very innovative, and who are asset light in a way, where we can find and uh, move forward. So uh, if, you, if you look into lending process, these are all the, maybe uh, you originate the lead, then you process it, and why will you able to originate the lead? The customer has really to like your product. Because anyway, you have to give a differentiated product, then only he'll go for you. Otherwise, there are so many uh, established players all around. Then you do the credit check of it, uh, then you probably disburse the loan in the customer's account, and thereafter, very important, you have to keep on managing his repayment cycle, which is maybe over a particular duration for which you have given the loan. Now, of course, a certain data, maybe 62 crore internet users as of now, or by 2022, we will have that figure around 82 crores. Very, very, I mean, that shows the kind of exponential uh, growth uh, which we are witnessing. And of course, the ecosystem, uh, which again, uh, we had discussion in the morning, the entire ecosystem, uh, the regulatory framework and all has been very, very encouraging. So even when we are collecting things, it's more to do with ENATCH, UPI, uh, the sandbox approach which RBI has brought in. So a lot of uh, positivity uh, in the entire whole ecosystem. Now, how do we differentiate? So whenever a customer comes to us on our portal, uh, it's now, it's become more of, earlier it was like for a branch. So either you visit a branch or you have to get in touch with a DSA or a DST or an agent. Now it's at a, on your mobile phone or your laptop, you go, you discover the product, and you customize everything. So earlier it was like uh, the rate of interest, the tenure, your loan amount, everything was decided by the bank. Here we say, hey, you decide what you want. What is the rate of interest you want? What is the tenure you want? Of course, we'll have a maximum minimum limit based on our uh, heuristics and our criteria. So every down, uh, everything, it's like do-it-yourself do kind of a loan, <coughs> loan approach which he has. And so, uh, and if you see, uh, uh, our sourcing model, uh, I mean 60% sourcing is happening from mobile itself. Uh, when we see our, I mean 40% people are still coming through des desktop for us. Now this gives us a very big edge. We don't have branches, we hardly have two physical branches, but we are operating across all the major cities in India. For which maybe a bank has to build a very big infrastructure. It will be very, very asset heavy. For us it's very, very asset light. And we are able to meet, uh, reach out to millions of people. So uh, when it comes to lead processing, again, we have a credit processing and we have a lot of inbuilt uh, heuristics, inbuilt algorithm which uh, sp speeds up the entire process. And we have customized a uh, lot, uh, lot of credit evaluation which happens. I mean, in conventional setups, you'll have a credit processing associate who will sit down, note down the details, make a cam sheet, uh, work on excels. Here, entire data point is picked up. Uh, so the whole process becomes very, very faster. Now, Essentially, if I look into a smaller loan amount, typically one to 10 lakh kind of a loan amount, it doesn't really need a very, very deep financial analysis. Maybe a five crore loan will require, or maybe a rupees 10 crore loan will require, but maybe a five lakh rupee or maybe a 10 lakh rupee won't require that kind of a deep analysis of financial data. So what you need is a basic financial data and which you can read, uh, easily get online. I mean, the customer can share it online on your uh, website and you have all the checks and balances to verify whether it's genuine or not. You can always verify the banking transactions and all, which you all do at the back end at a very great speed. Another way where we have uh, seen is a major change which has happened is uh, in the marketplace itself. Earlier, if you had to buy food or a grocery, you used to go online. I mean, you used to go to several shops. Now it's all online. Similarly, if you have to, I mean, Amazons of the world, uh, big baskets of the world, PTMs of the world, it's become so common now that for us, now for even for giving business loan, we have a very, very big segment who are working with these online portals, online biggies, and they also want to take business loans. But they are not very big people. It's about more in terms of financial inclusion. I mean, business people who need a loan of maybe one lakh rupee or a two lakh rupee, and they don't really have that kind of a big balance sheets and big returns over several years, which a conventional bank will require. When we do an analysis of such a case, what we work on is we get a lot of data from our partners. So if I tie up with our biggest wallet company of India, or if I uh, tie up with one of the biggest uh, grocery, online grocery uh, chains of India, I get the data of, uh, data of seller over the last six months or one year. So it helps their ecosystem, the online marketplace, and it also helps me. I'm able to really uh, mitigate any kind of fraud risk over there. So a lot of data happens. A lot of data flows into us. So this entire change has 
really uh, given that kind of an impetus for organizations like us to find that sweet spot where we can uh, deliver the products in a very uh, customized way and in a very cost efficient ways and even after post disbursement customer care and all if you talk about more and people more and more people really want to interact on facebook whatsapp uh, twitter and all rather than physically visiting offices or calling on an ivr so that kind of approach we have given to the customer and which has completely changed the ecosystem thank you thanks amit shall i so uh, um I would like to add a different uh, sort of flavor to this discussion. Uh, often, at times, we talk about uh, new technologies that that are there on the shelf, uh, whether it is machine learning, AI, or blockchain. We also uh, talk about the overall ecosystem, which has been developed in last few years. But I want to talk about what I think is lacking as of now in the overall uh, fintech startup ecosystem. Maybe even uh, uh, from the uh, government side. um having spent some time in silicon valley then in indian silicon valley bangalore and now uh, running uh, ziplon for last 3 to 4 years i think still a lot of time and investment needs to be uh, made around customer segmentation uh, knowing your customer uh, not not on the kyc side but actually understanding the context and the environment in which your customer operate right um in last 3 years what we have realized is uh, actually you can find a very good technical talent in india who can uh, who can build good uh, tech systems uh, we at ziplon have developed our entire uh, crm our loan origination our loan management system uh, in house but what we lacked initially uh, was understanding our uh, customer better capturing the data in the proper format so that over few years we can start uh, serving that particular customer base so um, i believe that when you are building your technology team when you are building your technology also invest in good product managers good product designers people who can empathize and want to meet your customers there is definitely even like we when we are serving small business uh, proprietorship firms and we are giving them a uh, we are just doing one product as of now though we have uh, done close to 6000 loans but even in the same customer segment uh, there are different kind of customers with different kind of personas and uh, different requirements so one guy might be looking for a business loan uh, because he wants to start something new or someone might be looking for a business loan because uh, there is a short term working capital need so uh, there i feel that still we are lacking over there now on the product side as well when you have your consumer facing applications whether it is as simple as an application form or your customer dashboards how you are servicing him post uh, uh, purchase as well there a lot of iterations are required where still i feel that a, a lot of uh, fintechs or startups uh, in initially create something but the iteration the kind of iteration which you see in silicon valley startups where they do more than 100 iterations in a year that is lacking right now so uh, having learned it hard way uh, the two key areas that we focus today is uh, understanding our customer better and building the right kind of data architecture a lot of inferences and insights can be drawn only from simple descriptive analytics you don't need advanced machine learning for it but you need to invest in that particular data thanks sir uh, i think the point that you mentioned and what amit covered earlier one quick thought here which is there's a natural alignment for ecosystem partnerships within the value chain right both upstream and downstream but is there a space for or do you see a lot of ecosystem activity happening within the setups for example as a digital nbfc or a fintech you would be engaging with let's say a lot of banks now each one of you is engaging in apis for your format is there a scope to standardize those to your point on is there a way to share experience standards or journey so that we as an ecosystem come up right so are there any is there a merit in a thought like that is there some activity happening in areas like that yeah so i see that uh, since these fintechs are operating in silos there is a lot of duplication work which is going on so fintechs are developing the same system which the earlier banks have developed or let's say companies like sap have already developed so everyone is developing its own loan origination system everyone is developing its own loan management system everyone is developing its own uh, credit scoring methodologies so definitely that duplication uh, is not helping as a, to the overall ecosystem um, 
uh, at the same time, like uh, we at Ziplon also co-land with other banks and uh, they use uh, our uh, sort of technology uh, to underwrite their own customer base, uh, the customer which they have not uh, been able to serve uh, business loans for last 10 years. So uh, definitely we are going in that direction, but the pace uh, which have been helpful is still not there. So when you look at European markets, they have open banking, right? So uh, there's a platform, uh, you, everyone can access uh, data from different uh, bank accounts through those open banking APIs. So there is no layer of duplication. So something what UPI has done should be done across uh, more uh, sort of data points that we need. Interesting. Yeah. Mr. Rao, that sets you up very nicely on uh, is there a ro what is your view on uh, how the ecosystem is playing out and is there a space for technology product companies to create lighter platforms which could power uh, some of these fintech spaces? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. As a technology company, we do have a, we do have a responsibility for that and a technology company like SAP we have realized that, you know, and uh, we strongly believe that we, you need to have proper ecosystem and within SAP, we are actively, what do you call it, uh, uh, taking up, having the right kind of ecosystems with various programs we have uh, launched, you know, for participating within the, in the startup companies and uh, uh, and, and taking them through the journey of the technology uh, adoption, identification, adoption, and as he rightly pointed out, uh, uh, we do have a responsibility to articulate that a, a, a uniform platform can be made available you know, to all the participants where duplication of efforts can be reduced. You know? And uh, we have a strong plan, we believe that uh, ecosystem definitely plays a part and and uh, and and it is it is a must for uh, beneficial of everyone yeah thank you mr rao uh, mr silva just to get into the conversation you really coming from a different lens of promoting a, a corridor uh, what are your experiences in this area yes uh, well thank you very much for the invitation um, I think I can maybe echo the words of uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant, who talks about the uh, fintech revolution. And uh, this is precisely what we have been seeing in Brazil as well happening, with the characteristics very close to the Indian fintech revolution, and not perhaps not that close to the fintech revolutions we have seen in uh, developed uh, countries. So basically, meaning that the fintech revolution is uh, happening through uh, the, we see, we've seen the emergence of uh, um, startups, uh, the amount of Brazilian startups that were created in 2018 uh, was about, it increased by 30-40% and also with the challenge of uh, financial inclusion, which uh, I think we uh, share with, uh, with India. And precisely because of this uh, similar characteristics, we have uh, decided last month to organize the first uh, India-Brazil FinTech conference, which uh, took place in, in Mumbai. And uh, I think the, the main uh, takeaways from this uh, conference was, first, of course, uh, financial inclusion. So we, uh, Brazil and India, have uh, in the past four or five years managed to uh, uh, let's say, bring lots of the uh, significant part of the low-income population to the financial sector, but there is still, we need to be conscious that there's still a significant amount which is still unbanked, still out. And uh, also on top of that, considering that the popula this population who has been recently uh, boarded in, uh, there is, and there is some reports indicating that uh, some of these uh, bank accounts that have been opened, they are, uh, to some extent, they remain un unactive. So I think uh, startups are uniquely uh, positioned, fintechs are uniquely positioned because of uh, their, e uh, I mean, because of internet, because of mobility, and also because of their lean organizational uh, uh, structure, 
they are uniquely positioned to address these uh, two challenges. The other uh, main takeaway of this uh, interaction between Brazil and India was on, let's say, on the uh, supporting infrastructure and regulation. Again, Brazil and India have uh, done a lot in the past years. India, as uh, Mr. Amitab Kant uh, mentioned, uh, I think it has to be lauded because uh, uh, due, to its, uh, to, due to the India's tech and this, let's say, te technological infrastructure that allowed for a seamless integration of the financial sector. This is something that Brazil hasn't yet achieved and I think we will learn a lot from India. And on the regulation side, uh, Brazil has uh, enacted, this Brazilian Central Bank has enacted some uh, regulations in 2018 that allowed for uh, Brazilian startups, especially in the loan and lending sector, to, to come in and to be officially recognized as a, as a, a financial uh, institution. But still, again, challenges need to be overcome. I think uh, we need regulation in both markets for what we call open banking, uh, basically allowing, uh, let's say, uh, more uh, some fintechs to have access to banking data. This has, of course, to be accompanied by a very efficient data protection law. So uh, Brazil approved its data protection law in 2018. This is uh, yet to come here in India, but I think things are progressing. Um, and uh, I think also uh, appropriate sandbox regulation as well so to allow uh, these, let's say, fintechs to come and test in a limited environment to test their innovations. And uh, third, I think, uh, takeaway from our, uh, let's say, meeting was uh, technology. I think um, we, uh, Brazil and India, both enjoy uh, our have a very good exit, which is basically a very young population, which is tech savvy and also early adopters of uh, technology. But uh, I think we need still to concentrate on developing the skills, the necessary skills on these emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and uh, blockchain to, uh, let's say, uh, motivate further innovations in, in this area. So I think these are uh, were, it was a really a great experience having this conference uh, and we are now looking forward to have the second edition next year where we, some of the collaborations that have been actually formalized within that, uh, uh, this event will be, let's say, fostered further uh, so we can encourage uh, stronger ties between our two countries. Thank you, Mr. Silva. If I can stick on that point a little further. Uh, so, really from a fintech ecosystem perspective, the whole corridor strategy and market access are important themes. Uh, the question really I had for you was, what is the incentive for the state to be involved in these activities and how? The state? As a, like as a Brazil as a state or India as a state, mm -hmm. and as we on corridor, what is the incentive for the state to be involved mm -hmm. in this and what is the end outcome uh, to be expected? Yeah, I think, uh, well, the, uh, I, can, I can talk, of course, from the um, from Brazilian point of view. I think the, uh, the state uh, plays an important role here in uh, fostering uh, innovation uh, ecosystems. Uh, we, let's say, as uh, the, the role, the I think the, the reason for organizing this event in, in Mumbai was precisely because our embassy, we have uh, identified that both India and Brazil have very dynamic uh, fintech sectors. Actually, if we take uh, the Fintech 100 report from uh, 2018, we see that both Brazil and India have uh, uh, one, of the uh, one of the most uh, innovative fintechs in, in the world. So we've seen that, of course, so we've seen that there are, uh, let's say it's uh, important uh, segments in our countries, but those segments haven't been talking to each other. We haven't been, we haven't uh, managed to provide a platform for those, uh, let's say, uh, stakeholders or these actors of these sectors to, to uh, collaborate and to interact with each other. Normally, as it happens uh, with Brazil, it also happens in India, we tend to look uh, more towards the United States or Europe for looking for uh, cooperation and we uh, sometimes uh, forget that we may have uh, even more uh, interesting 
uh, solutions in our, uh, let's say, uh, by exploring South-South collaboration. So I think this has been, let's say, one of the areas where the state and uh, especially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil has been trying to, to push. And, uh, and also I think we've seen a, a good acceptance from Indian from the Indian government, Niti Aayog actually has uh, supported us in this uh, in this initiative, and I see I think it makes a uh, lot of sense to pursue pursue this further. Thank you, um, Amit. Let me come you with a, come to you with a point on uh, the other space where I think ecosystems can play a big role, which is uh, in the area of something like digital literacy. Uh, now, the reason I'm bringing that point forward is at the heart of it. FinTech is converting certain non-consumers, unincluded segment into the included segment, and that to using technology. And uh, just your experience on that as to the segments you're playing with, how strong and uh, how strong is financial as well as digital literacy in that segment, and what role do you think ecosystem can play in fostering that further? Yeah, uh, Vivek, uh, just taking cue from what you asked and what. Uh, Shalab also uh, was pointing out that it's very critical for all the people uh, who are in this ecosystem to be really having that kind of an empathy and see the things from a customer's perspective. Then only you'll be able to differentiate. For instance, uh, all along, almost uh, two decades which I've spent in uh, banking sector, I mean, if a customer needed uh, uh, three lakh of personal loan, uh, but our rule said no, only we can give you two lakh seventy-five thousand. So there was no way of deviating. Now, if you are taking a call of two lakh seventy-five thousand on an individual, but to take a call of three lakh, otherwise don't give him money at all. Or if somebody asks for a loan of a tenure of say four year, and you are ready to give him for thirty-six months, so I mean, why not another four months or another ten months? My specific question is really that: what is the challenges on the other side? Do people understand this? For example, you might say that it's a flexible tenure. Now, the common experience people have is. EMIs are EMIs, right? But suddenly you say that no, no, it's flexible tenure. Uh, so do they really get it? Do they understand so the risks I, with it? What can ecosystem so do I, for I'll that? So I'll tell you, they fully understand it. Uh, now I'll talk about one of the biggest unsecured segment in India. It's a six lakh crore of personal loan. This uh, unsecured loan, specially given to salaried individuals, it's always known as a personal loan. Now look at the end use of it. It can be for a, somebody's medical emergency. It can be for house renovation. It can be for wedding, it can be for holiday. So the end use which a customer has is very, very different. So the kind of cash flows which he wish, which his cash flows, the way it will be structured will be very different. So it's not that we only permit, I mean, EMI is the wrong word to use. Why only EMIs? I mean, customer should be having the uh, privilege of paying through bullet repayments uh, when he's getting a, maybe a bonus or a salary increment, maybe slightly lesser outflow when he's really coming out of a medical emergency or from a very high expensive, maybe a foreign tour or a marriage expense and all. So that kind of uh, innovation we have brought in through technology where customer understands the difference that, okay, here uh, I am really able to map his cash flows rather than only sticking to a conventional EMI pattern uh, formula which is there for uh, so long a year. I mean, repayment can happen through different modes, right? It need not be only through EMI. It can be uh, going through, so, uh, I mean, there were products like Surf, Flip and all, uh, which certain banks experimented at some point of time, maybe during recession and all, it they, they understood in a different way. But for a small ticket, that is the kind of innovation probably we have brought in. And you, in your view, customers understand it. That's yeah, yeah, the, that's they your understand point it very well, and that's, that's one of the biggest differentiators. It's a little different from what I've understood from the market, but we can yeah. move on to Shalab. On literacy, any challenges that you see, security, uh, product features, so on and so no, forth, any I think, role? Uh, yeah. I think it's a very, uh, very valid point, important point that you have raised. And uh, one of the key challenges that startup face today uh, is to build the brand or awareness uh, for your target customer segment. Specifically, talking about our customer segment, uh, there are 70 million uh, MSMEs in India, out of which there is only 1 million uh, companies or uh, LLPs which are registered with MCA. Now, out of these 69 million uh, MSMEs, first of all, uh, the entire data is not consolidated. It's spread across different labor departments for uh, each state. Uh, second, uh, when we do a survey in any sort of business cluster, so more than 90% of the customers would not show interest in your loan product, right? 
So because either they are uh, already uh, have established channels through private money lenders, shit funds, or their family or friends, and there is a lot of hesitation in understanding uh, how uh, this will play out, how they will pay the EMI, what documents would you require, what security would you take. Um, building that awareness for a startup standalone is very difficult. I think something what uh, what has been done in the mutual fund industry, it has to be a joint initiative, might be led by government, and then all the relevant startups can join in this program to improve the financial literacy of uh, the target customer base. Um, there are a lot of initiatives which MSME government, uh, MSME ministry uh, takes. A lot of content is being generated. Again, a lot of startups are generating a lot of content in parallel. So I think uh, as the industry matures now, there is a sufficient room for consolidation of efforts, at least on the financial literacy. Um, and the um, uh, re uh, talking about uh, particular examples uh, from our own customer base, uh, people really don't understand what is reducing interest rate, what is flat interest rate. Uh, they, uh, they are being served interest rate as high as 50% uh, by certain private money lenders, but their understanding is that I am serving a loan at 14% interest rate. So there is sufficient gap in the literacy which they need and only after one or two years down the cycle they realize what they have done, which brings further sort of hesitation uh, to try out something new. So, yeah. yeah I hear you. And uh, just as an anecdote on this, if you think about digital payments, at some level you could have thought that the whole Beam experiment would be a kind of a digital financial literacy experiment. It was government-led, government-promoted. It showed a way for that to work. It built credibility into UPI platform. And then it was easy for many other players to join on the bandwagon. So there could be a couple of models by which it could it could really play out. So like government recently launched their 59 minutes program, which a lot of public sector banks and uh, even now, I think uh, Kotak Bank has recently joined that program. So that's a good initiative, but I think uh, uh, startups have an edge uh, particularly uh, on being able to do a lot of iterations in their product life cycles. So it's time that uh, government at least uh, bring those uh, uh, startups with critical base uh, into, into their platform um, and start educating the customers. Yeah. I mean, just to build on that point, and uh, Mr. Rao getting into a conversation, and Amit, if you want to come back in, is what are the other roles or asks from a government or a regulatory perspective? in this segment, again, because they play an important role as an ecosystem enabler. And Mr. Silva, I'll ask you to weigh in in your Brazilian experience, based on what we hear, anything delta that you have seen that Brazil has done that we can learn from. Uh, Amit, do you want to take a stab? Mr. Rao, if you want to join in. And you can also add in maybe from SAP as a large incumbent tech organization, what are the other initiatives that you might be doing to support it? Yeah. So uh, two parts to it, uh, Vivek. I'll come to your very specific query in the second part. First, just adding on to what uh, Shalav had very rightly pointed out, reaching out to MSMEs. Now, 70% uh, of our client base is salaried, so it's a very different ball game. Uh, in MSME, I think, of course, there needs to be certain push enablers from government side, but uh, the ecosystem has changed drastically. Whether you talk in terms of a uh, Sitapur, Raibareli, Fezabad, Muzaffarpur, Darbhanga, any place you know of, uh, there will be a reach of uh, Amazon, Flipkart, and people are selling. Uh, there are, I mean, Paytm users, if you see, they are all across, all across, I mean, the remote. I will not say it's fully penetrated, still a long way to go, but the kind of discussions we have in morning, we have heard, the kind of exponential growth which is happening, so the things are very bright. The way we have worked is, like, we have tied up with all these people. Anyway, anybody who goes on this platform and sells, they anyway are uh, basically a digitally enabled... Sorry, Ask from regulatory and, and government. Yeah, and the second part of it, uh, the RE part. Uh, for instance, uh, even uh, as far as uh, there are two critical pa aspects when it when it when we talk in terms of lending. One is on the KYC part. As long as Aadhaar was uh, fully available uh, till last year, it was of great help. Uh, with all the challenges which have happened, and all of us are aware over the last uh, eight ten months. Even yesterday, we had a RBI circular, but still it talks about offline uh, verification by the. Uh, uh, reporting entities, except the banks. Like, we being NBFCs, we have to again uh, verify in an offline mode, so that TAT gets affected. So that is one area where we'd like to have a regulatory help. Second was on the NASH part, e-NASH part. 
So with again, uh, uh, because of Aadhaar impact, again, the natural registration, that is the collection piece, which most of us would be understanding of the way you take, I mean, it's like earlier ECS, what used to happen later on Nash, uh, National Automatic Clearing House. So uh, that authentication again became a problem after Aadhaar went off. So now again, net banking based and uh, your debit card based authentication has started, but still there are only eight banks who are partially live, four are only fully live, there are still many banks to come up. So these are true, uh, two very critical areas where uh, if there is any regulatory intervention, it will be of great help to us. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, just to add to this, uh, again, drawing an analogy from uh, US, uh, so in India, uh, your credit uh, score is just a function of the loans that you have uh, taken in the past, including credit cards or any kind of overdraft facility. But in US, uh, any kind of telcos data, any kind of utility bill payments that you are doing, everything is a part of your uh, credit scorecard. So uh, if government drives this particular change over a couple of years, where they include all the electricity bill payments, all the water bill payments, all the gas bill payments, and um, all the telcos data uh, as a part of the credit scorecard. And I think there is a project which a uh, government is working on, which the is PC. called Public Credit Registry. PCR. Yeah. Um, we, I just hope that it gets finished. <laughs> I also hope. <laughs> right? But uh, that particular change can drive a lot of financial inclusion. Um, and it's all about uh, data in the end and the consolidation of the data, which I think will be a major uh, contribution to the financial inclusion. Sure. Mr. Rao? So, see, we, we being a technology company, you know, so we definitely feel that uh, ecosystem development is a must. And uh, we, as SAP, we have different programs where we would like uh, partners to participate. Or we, if we see a potential in it, we participate. Like, we, we, we have programs like SAP Startup Focus, SAP IO, what we call it, investment, innovation office. See, these are basically into the startups which uh, uh, do the innovations in these blockchains or uh, uh, ML part of it or AI part of it, you know. And if this really clicks, uh, SAP also funds them. We are into that also. And we guide them in the entire journey, you know. And, and we, 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 we facilitate in certification of their uh, innovations so that adaptability and adoption of it becomes easier for them. We, we have a life cycle journey which has been uh, charted out and we are looking out for this kind of participation and uh, we would like to participate and develop the ecosystem and we believe a lot in it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Silva, if you want to come in from what you have heard and anything Delta you want to add in what you observed with Brazil. Yes, uh, I think uh, on your question about, uh, I mean, the role of the, the government, uh, I think it's uh, important to mention. I think that when, when you talk about uh, innovation uh, ecosystems, I think uh, government has typically uh, two roles to play. One uh, is uh, the regulatory role, so making sure all the laws and regulations are in place to uh, allow for uh, really seamless uh, and effective innovation so that the uh, ac actors, private actors, feel uh, encouraged to, to, to be part of this uh, and to, to contribute to, to the ecosystem. The other, the other role of the government, which I uh, think is uh, fundamental, is what has what has been termed as the entrepreneurial state. So, uh, uh, governments, uh, states, uh, through targeted funding, through uh, large procurement uh, projects, uh, and through uh, public companies, uh, creating new markets. So, uh, being responsible for bringing in disruptive technologies and then making sure to create a, a sufficient base so that the, again, private actors can come in and build on what has been, let's say, uh, uh, constructed. So I think uh, we have a uh, wonderful case with India in the, let's say, the, the India stack. I think uh, government has played a key role in, let's say, providing this uh, infrastructure so that, uh, which was fundamental for the fintech revolution here in India. 
And I think there are many uh, other sectors I can talk about, uh, not specifically about the fintech sector in Brazil, but for example, the aerospace sector in the country, which started with a government uh, initiative, uh, creating a larger uh, company, and then was, after decades, has been taken over by the private sector. So I think uh, government uh, has a fundamental role, not only as regulator, but also as uh, being uh, able to create new markets. Uh, so I think that's uh, really important. Excellent. I'll just relate two of my personal experience on the working with the state on this one. So I'm currently working with government of Maharashtra. Uh, they've set up an entity called Mumbai FinTech Hub to support FinTech development in the state. Uh, so the first thing, again, I come in from a classic corporate mind and mindset, right? So. Uh, well, I said, if you want to promote the policy, we should have a fintech department. And when we start looking around, interestingly enough, uh, Maharashtra state doesn't even ha have a FS department. Right? So it was just by an accident that we became the FS capital in the country. But FS is not a recognized industry. So we said, okay, let's the first job to be done is let's lay down the policy. So one draft of the policy exists. We are currently revamping the policy, calling 2.0, and building some right elements to, uh, to your point, Mr. Silva, of promoting that sector and industry. Uh, but if anyone, like, we are still working through on this industry has got such specific needs, right? Because it's a knowledge-based industry as opposed to, like, a power industry or anything else where you can build infrastructure. So what incentives and what will really help to fintechs? Any of the views here, please reach out to me. That would be helpful. Second is on the talent stream, we felt that uh, we, we do need a lot of engineers. We do need a lot of designers and product managers. I do think going forward, we'll require a lot of digital feet on street as well. Because purely digital, you can go only so far. Uh, so we have launched a, a, a free kind of a training program created by industry and academia. Uh, it's called Uday. You can look it up as well. Which we are launching at colleges, uh, free of cost for students to take that additional program and course structure. Uh, so there again, like all of us who have been in part of the industry, we're inviting them to come and add your batch content to it. So we realize that once you just create a highway similar to Aadhaar, uh, so we are looking at this education program almost like a highway, saying that we can reach the colleges and students, uh, whether you're industry, academia, uh, coming from technology, uh, you can come and contribute your courses there. That's the second initiative. Uh, we've started with Maharashtra, but all of these we are looking at almost incubating it in one space and expanding it to wherever we want to go to. The third area is again going with a highway construct, creating a funding highway. Saying that can we have a platform where we can have, let's say, top 50 VCs on the same page? and reduce the information asymmetry which ex exists. Today, if you know people, you will get access to good investors and raise money. But knowing should never be a, uh, be a bottleneck. So we said, let's rule that out. So there's called a platform called Find. It should go live in next one month. Uh, it is for both debt as well as equity fundraise as well as strategic partnerships. So we said, let's make that a level playing field. But after that, government will step back. It is for the industry to run with it. So we don't want to drag government in new states of doing work. But we realize the power of creating such societal platforms and, and really for all of us to contribute in whichever way we can, because effectively we are seeding the next level of business growth when we end up doing things like this. So those will be the last of few of my remarks. I hope this was helpful. We can take a couple of queries if they have anyone has one or two, and you can redirect to the panel or specific people and happy to respond to that. Thanks for adding relevance, otherwise we wouldn't have considered it. <laughs> uh, we don't have mics, right? Do we have mics or should we take it offline? You can speak up, yeah, it's a small hall. Which is there. I think there is still a need, there is a lot of uh, regulatory activism in the country still now. Um, there is still uh, fintech is growing very well. Payment side is working very well. I, I relate to eNash and everything also. I have worked on that itself. But I think there is a very high amount of activism on the regulatory side. I think the regulators need to look at... But they're meant to be active. <laughs> no, no, but they can be active on the development side as well. Rather than be too active on the regulatory on side. The, on the, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, this forum is a good forum where SHM can actually go back and this government is listening. This government is interested. Came back with a great mandate. So I'm sure they will uh, they will look at it and they will if if the message goes to them that yeah don't lose the controls I think when I think the world lost control in India still stood strong it was because of our regulators because of the 
uh, agencies but still we still have acts or regulations which are of 1938 and yeah there are changes which keep coming but the base is still 1938 sure. we are in 21st century i think there is a very strong need to look at that then only i think this will move at a will galvanize and move at a very Fair fast just to be very action oriented on this one so you can reach out to varun from assochem i think we can include that comments okay. i was part of the fintech conclave which mr kant and itiyo had organized around month back with the same agenda which some of us here might have also attended uh there the thought process was just to get a feedback from the entire we got 100 plus fintechs who were part of the session there were i might remember right around five tracks where discussions happened open forum regulators were there asked the fintechs to share their input and which was so rbi sandbox discussion paper came within two weeks after that session so efforts are there i realize there would be a journey but but keep this feedback coming in as a industry body we can are happy to pass it back to the back to the right stakeholders hi so. i'm sapna deslani from bpnc advisors my question is to amit and shalab could you please uh, throw some light on uh, what innovation digital nbfcs have done on the collection side as against the lending side that both of you spoke about good point uh, so uh, when you talk in terms of collection one is uh, the soft buckets if you talk in terms of very often uh, it is because of natch issues i mean if natch gets delayed the registration uh, gets delayed then you have to keep on uh, reminding the customer so we have certain automated systems in place uh, where a customer keeps on getting sms uh, if and uh, there are certain links also sent to him if he is not able to pay in time so it's more of an omni channel approach which we have kept in uh, through which a customer can pay on time so uh, that is uh, broadly and with the enash uh, piece becoming stronger i think this will be uh, broadly taken care of as far as normal collections are concerned uh, when you talk in terms of uh, real npas uh, so one can be uh, which is totally re uh, relevant and macroeconomic about which you can't do much uh, other can be creeping from the uh, fraud element uh, which might be there so it's more to do with prevention of fraud uh, at that stage where again uh, we have uh, again uh, tried to develop the ecosystem over there where there were conventional build, uh, vendors working with conventional banks in their own uh, ways but we have helped them develop apis uh, we have uh, helped them do geo tagging so uh, in every case for instance when we uh, do a disbursement there is a, uh, a physical check happening uh, uh, with the customer where uh, we we do the geo tagging of the residents we do take certain photographs and so uh, and all that data flows very real time to us so the tat also is not affected so probably these are the innovations which uh, really help in streamlining the whole process i just had two before shalab comes in one slightly jokingly one innovation which i have seen is to take the emi as far as the money hits your bank account right so and that's a model which i have seen um, the initial sme lending startups do personal loan startups do uh, and the idea being that when you are when you are working in that segment where the transaction frequency is super high it's not it is not intent to pay sometimes you just have to forget prioritizing stuff so get the emi done first and then you can do other things is one model uh, the second model which i have seen which works in some sectors especially synthetic patient financing would be subvention models uh, where someone else is covering for some part of the loss uh, who is getting benefits of it and i think subvention has got a big space especially in the blue collar worker base as well so a lot of loans being done there you are seeing that their parent organizations are doing a subvention because they think financial health is good for their employees and they are anyways not giving them pension and a lot of other things so that is the other model more of a business model uh, in innovation but still so uh, what when we started what we observed on uh, what we initially sort of implemented was a collection framework where uh, we had people who who were calling these customers uh, we had some agencies working for us for the collections and we had some of our own people on the ground and then there was the communication to the customer uh, after any kind of delay or delinquency uh, over last one year what we have realized is a lot of this communication is broken and is not working right so you send sms to the customers that uh, your emi is overdue or you send a notification to the customer on his app that your emi is overdue and you have to pay by this time otherwise this penalty will be charged so we often think that customer is not reacting to it but the truth is customer is not even reading to reading that particular sms or that notification right uh, so the first change which we did is we built the uh, new 
communication framework uh, for different kind of customer buckets. So it's less than uh, DPD 30, which is days past due 30, DPD 30 to 60 and DPD to 90. And also we segmented these customers on the reason for default. Uh, did he default because he, he, he was not well? He's the only sole proprietor uh, responsible for his business. Uh, is it a fraud case? Uh, is there a business instability? What has been his trend in the past? And how he is responding to our uh, collections guy? Is he saying that I, I'll pay in uh, next 15 days? Or is he paying you charge me a lot of interest? So using all of this data, we have built a simple collection scorecard, which uh, every month uh, gives a new risk, uh, assign a new kind of risk uh, to this particular customer. And basis on this collection scorecard, we define what will be the communication journey. So should we send the SMS first and then email? And what should be the message in that particular SMS in email? And I would say this is still in the learning phase. We, we now uh, track whether this particular email has been opened, whether uh, uh, he has replied to it, whether this SMS has been read or not. And then we experiment with the communication that we are doing. I think that is the way to solve it for on a scale. And uh, this is what we are doing right now. Uh, so unfortunately, we got that much time. You can engage with all of us uh, outside. But one, thank you so much for your patient hearing. Question. Cheers. Thank you. One important question, please. I'm sorry. Can you search online? We have got other panels who get delayed. Yeah. Okay. But you can connect with any one of us offline. Unless you want to make a comment to the entire audience, you can uh, connect yeah, to actually, one of us. This is related to blockchain and uh, financial. So happy just... to connect it offline. Yeah, but I'm getting super, super hard stares from the organizers. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Thanks. Sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for patient hearing. Cheers. Have a good day. Well, thank you uh, very much, Vivek, uh, for so flawlessly uh, moderating and conducting the session. We apologize for the hard stairs, but we have our limitations too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to now start the next session. Um,